Hello and welcome to Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. You know what we like to do here. We want to enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best self. The tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Power. And that's what we're going to do today. We want to fire you up. We are talking about a leap into an ecological economy. That's right, you guys. This is a totally different subject than we've talked about before. And I know that you are going to be excited. My guest today is Professor Derek Paul, and he is out of Montreal, Canada. So the traditional economy is shown to be one that cannot address climate change and cannot bring the world to a sustainable state in which we consume no more than the earth can supply. The ecological economy can address climate changes and bring the world to sustainability by changing the main focus, which will be on the health of the biosphere. I told you this is going to be really interesting today, but let me tell you a little bit more about Professor Paul. Derek Paul is a retired physicist who has published in several fields. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Cambridge University and then worked for three years in industry. In 1953, he took up residence in Kingston, Ontario, teaching and doing research in um, atomic physics for a decade at the Royal Military College of Canada. He obtained a doctorate from Queen's University in 1958. Well, from 1954 to 1995, he was a professor at the University of Toronto. In 1976, he became a participant in the Pugwash Conference of Science and World Affairs with their uh, focus on peace issues. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979 and the maximum tension in the Cold War greatly changed his off-duty activities, which came to include co-founding Science for Peace in 1981. With several visits to the Soviet Union and one to East Germany, all on Peace Matters. Well, in 2005, he co-founded the Global Issues Project, which grew to a committee of 11 and organized international roundtables with over seven years on critical issues spanning forests, climate change, fresh water, food population, and no growth economy. Now, we also he also talked about peace in outer space. He has been motivated to write a book because of the urgent need for a new economic system that would enable the world to address the huge threat of climate change. He is a member of two physical um, societies, and one of them is the International Society for Ecological Economics and is a board member of the Coalition Climate Montreal. He lives in Montreal, Canada. So without any further ado, let's bring Professor Paul on into this conversation. Good morning, Professor. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me on Daily Spark. It's great to be here. I'm so glad that you are. So I have to ask you, what drove you as a physicist to write a leap to an ecological economy? It's a long train of things that began when I retired from the University of Toronto and I started looking at climate change and later other uh, important areas. And then in 2005, the Global Issues um, uh, Project began and all of us who participated in that became very aware of the connection uh, between one crucial issue, of which, of course, climate age change was only one, and, um, and the other issues. And, of course, one of them was the economic system. And I gradually learned that um, uh, it looked as if the present economic system really wasn't made to handle an emergency of the climate change variety. And I then later joined the International Society for Ecological Economics, read a lot of books, and, um, and uh, in 2014, I made my first list 
of changes that I thought was nece- were necessary in the economic system uh, to enable us to address climate change. And mm-hmm. in 2016, I looked around to see who had published all of this, and none of the economists had done so, had written a, a general book of that type for the general public, so I began writing myself. And I think that my picture is, is optimistic, uh, some of the good things are already happening, but there are also some, a few formidable challenges on the way. And that's, that's how it all happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, for those who are not familiar with the concept, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by ecological economy? Yes, well, there are, of course, two aspects here. One are the rules by which you operate, but more important, I think, is the background thinking that nobody ever talks about that's behind what you do and think. And the background thought uh, for an ecological economy is the health of the biosphere. Uh, Everything in the world has to be brought to the best state of health that you can, which means you stop polluting the ocean, for example, and the atmosphere, Mm -hmm. and you make sure that you're not uh, letting the forest, the soils in the forests uh, uh, get uh, deteriorate and so on. Uh, In the traditional economy, which is how I often refer to the present economy, the human race is, the thinking is that the human race is in charge with the right to exploit, Growth is always good, and technical, technological advance is pretty well always good. And mm-hmm. when you couple that combination with the, um, uh, the, the banking system we have and the legal system for the governance of corporations, it makes a pretty bad result. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, um, sole, um, uh, the sole responsibility for governing a corporation in many jurisdictions is simply to make a profit, and uh, how you make the profit is irrelevant. And mm. uh, one, my book explains that the United States has been the leader in recent years in a departure from that, and this is extremely good news. Nevertheless, there's a long way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, um, short-term profit, for example, keeps the coal industry going when it would be immensely to the uh, better interests of the United States and the world if coal-burning power stations were replaced by uh, electrical generation through renewable energy. But nevertheless, um, the, the system we have makes it very difficult uh, to close down Uh, coal-burning power stations and replace them because these industries continue to make profit uh, each year. And uh, my view is that over um, 300 years, uh, the coal and oil industries would actually make more profit in total if the burning of oil and coal ceased because these um, coal and oil are very important raw materials for the manufacture of plastics and clothing, for example. Uh, The ecological economy would would get us over the the difficulty uh, that we're we're stuck with a system that doesn't favor uh, necessary steps being taken. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're talking about the ecological economy, does this also include what um, the term that we're a little more familiar with, and that is climate change. Are they one and the same? Are they on the, the kind of the same spectrum? What's the connection? The the um, um, the e- ecological econ- economy would would in fact uh, make plans for reduction of the emissions. You'd have to set up all kinds of. Um, Uh, offices or groups to to study these things, Uh, they would have to assess all factors, then carry out the plans, and uh, the principal sources of energy uh, would be uh, ultimately wind and sun, because we're going to Mm -hmm. to have to close down uh, anything that uh, emits uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, When you do that, of course, People who are working 
in oil refineries or uh, some of the people working in the coal industry would no longer be needed and needed and they'd lose their jobs but they would find employment elsewhere um, and chapter 7 in, in my book uh, explains quite a bit of that there's an enormous amount of work that needs doing so um, shortage of employment is not going to be a barrier but there will be people shifting from one industry to another and that's been happening all along the the growth of the um, uh, uh, electrical industry the part that uh, that deals with uh, solar panels for instance has grown enormously in the last 20 years um, in in 20 to 30 years i believe that we can hugely reduce the emissions of polluting gases uh, mainly that is carbon dioxide um, and where the technologies already exist, those emissions could be reduced to zero uh, within about 25 years. Um, and I note in closing this section that the, the, the truck and automobile industries, with their hundreds of millions of users worldwide, uh, fall in that category because we do have the technologies now to replace uh, gasoline burning or diesel burning uh, trucks and cars. <clears throat> it's almost time for us to go to break. And I want to make sure that everyone is able to find you online. Can you oh, yes. please very quickly remind us where can we get a copy of your book and where can we find you online? Yes. Uh, online, I'm at uh, DerekLeverPaul.ca. Uh, Lever is spelled L-E-V-E-R, DerekLeverPaul.ca. Um, and um, my book, uh, um, I have a large print edition which I published myself, but the, um, the uh, usual edition is sold by uh, Archway Publishing, and it can be ordered at Barnes & Noble or, or any of the major stores, and it can be obtained from Amazon. Uh, so right. it's, it's readily available, and it's quite inexpensive. All right. Well, thank you, listeners. We need to go to break. We'll be back right after this. Not just a sec. What would it look like if we listened more? Could the right voice, the right set of words... Bring us all just a little closer. Get us to open up. Even push us further. It could, if we took the time to listen. The most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories. Download Audible and listen for a change. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. We are talking about the ecological economy today. And what are we doing to make sure that we are living our best environmental lives? Are we being as conscious and mindful to our environment as we possibly could be? Now, being someone who lives in California, um, listeners, many of you already know that California is very forward Thinking when it comes to the environment. Um, we have the Clean Air Act and we have solar panels that have um, just taken over, especially for our, our um, homeowners that live in the more desert areas of, of the state. So it is a wonderful thing to be able to talk about what we can do to make sure that we are helping out this place that we call home, and I mean our beautiful planet Earth. Um, now, Professor Paul, um, what would be um, a, a great way for our countries as a whole, and I'm talking internationally, what would be a great way for our countries to tackle this thing when it comes to emissions and making sure that we have cleaner air? Well, it, it can happen two ways. Uh, it can happen industrially because uh, industrial people have the right to, um, you know, close down their factory and build a new one to do something else. But it would be very much accelerated if you could get um, a, a bit of uh, help from policy at the level of government. 
And this in your country and in mine, which is Canada, uh, are the problems that the, the, um, the government is often uh, uh, not willing to take the necessary steps that would accelerate things. But there are things that individuals and corporations can do on their own. And I'm pleased to say a lot of that is happening, and that's good news. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really, it really is. Now, for a lot of um, major cities here in the States, and, and I'm sure they're in Canada as well, we have moved towards having electric cars and having uh, the hybrid cars because people are moving into a more mindful mindset when it comes to our environment. Is this something that is truly helping? Is it something that we need to actually take more interest in when it comes to affecting our environment and climate change? Um, The the answer is yes, of course it is. But uh, there's an organization called Drawdown in the United States, and they've done uh, what they call an optimistic uh, projection of that, uh, the development of electric cars, for example, and um, non-emitting vehicles uh, into the future, to the year 2050. And they find that on their projections, only 6% of the enormous number of vehicles in the world uh, will be electric by that time or Mm. or non-polluting by that time. And this actually is too slow. Uh, uh, We need a more general awareness of the grave climate threat um, in the the minds of a lot of people and um, a determination to to, um, get everybody Uh, of polluting vehicles, which could be done in Canada and the United States in 25 years, Mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. long before this would be, I would think by 2040 or 2042, it could be achieved and for sure by 2044 or five, uh, probably sooner. Mm -hmm. So what do what do you think is part of the pushback for the average citizen when it comes to uh, cleaner cars? Do they think that the, the power just isn't there because there's no because it's not burning gasoline? Is it the size of the vehicle? Um, what tends to be the problem or the the concern? I shouldn't say problem. What what well, tends to be the concern or the issue yeah. when it comes to the mindset of the citizen purchasing the car? Well, the the one of the big issues, of course, is is price because at the moment the electric cars are more expensive than um, mm. the gasoline cars, especially much more expensive than the cheapest uh, of the gasoline burning cars, which are still very. Um, inexpensive on the market today mm-hmm. and this is why if you want to make the conversion uh, uh, and, and uh, altogether put a halt uh, to um, emissions from vehicles you, you have to have a policy because uh, the price uh, alone is unlikely to do it by 2050 whereas mm-hmm. by, um, by just deciding to do it let, let's do this uh, if we just decide to do it we can do it by uh, by before 2050, uh, mm-hmm. and um, uh, instead of having a six percent improvement in our situation by 2050, my view is that would probably be a disaster mm-hmm. uh, if it were if it went at the the lower speed, which um, a drawdown has projected in in their book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now there are so many people that understand that climate change is happening. They are able to see with their own eyes, like they don't need, they don't necessarily need a report from a National Geographic or from any science program or even on the news that says that our, our environment is changing. They're simply able to open their eyes and see it for themselves. But then we have people that for whatever reason, they're not able to see it quite as clearly. And they would argue with you that, well, the ice caps are simply melting because it's just the the time of year for them to melt. Or, no, the the water table is not uh, increasing. Or, you know, the animals are fine. Whatever, Whatever their particular issue is. So 
for the person who says that climate change is not a huge threat, what should our response be for those who believe that, yes, our world is truly changing? Um, that, that's an excellent question for which I thank you. Um, my view for a long time on that very question has been that um, the problem with the, the science of climate change is that most of the new data that come out um, are emphasizing uh, things like worse storms or, as you just mentioned, the melting ice in the Arctic and so on. And those are not the things that could end the human race. The thing that mm -hmm. could wipe out the human race is the acidification of the ocean. Mm. And what happens is people burn uh, coal or oil or anything else and the carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and then you have an excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it diffuses into the ocean. And the ocean, which is normally alkaline, becomes less alkaline with time and this by the way has been measured very carefully and it is happening and there's a considerable difference between the alkalinity of the ocean as it was uh, 50 years ago and as it is now and uh, the problem with that is it affects the species in the ocean and uh, the particular danger is that the ocean will become acid instead of alkaline when that happens you eliminate a lot of species. The, the crustaceans can't make their, their shells, and so they die out, and the fish that uh, have uh, bones and spines have difficulty making the bones. And then finally, when it gets to a certain degree of alkalinity, um, you lose the plankton, which are uh, uh, enormous sources of oxygen for the whole world. And once you cut off the oxygen, uh, it makes life very difficult for things on land. And it was um, Alana Mitchell published a book oh, about 15 years ago called um, <clears throat> uh, Seasick. And her point was that um, if the ocean dies, um, life on land will be terribly badly affected and probably all the mammals will die too and most other species. And uh, a similar thing happened 252 million years ago, and it's known in the literature. You can find it on uh, uh, on Wikipedia. It's called the um, <coughs> the um, Permian Triassic transition, when the climate changed much as ours is changing, except in those days it did it much slower. But it wiped out 95% of all the species in the world. And it took the forests about 5 million years to recover after the transition. So the earth was in a pretty bad state for uh, 5 million years after the Permian Trans Triassic transition. And scient uh, earth scientists have been saying that the transition we're in now is very similar to that one, except it's taking place faster. So that's the threat. It's, it's not the melting of the ice on the, in Greenland, um, though that will raise the level of the ocean and it will cause us some trouble. But that won't do us in as a species. <clears throat> it's almost time for us to go to break. And I want to make sure that everyone is able to find you online. Can you oh, yes. please very quickly remind us where can we get a copy of your book and where can we find you online? Yes. Uh, online, I'm at uh, DerekLeverPaul.ca. Uh, Lever is spelled L-E-V-E-R, DerekLeverPaul.ca. Um, and um, my book, uh, um, I have a large print edition, which I published myself, but the, um, the uh, usual edition is sold by uh, Archway Publishing, and it can be ordered at Barnes & Noble or, or any of the major stores, and it can be obtained from Amazon. Uh, so right. it's, it's readily available, and it's quite inexpensive. All right. Well, thank you, listeners. We need to go to a break. We'll be back right after this.
Smell Good Spa for the women who are making a conscientious change in their personal care products. Specializing in signature fragrance oils, hand-dipped incense, and wholesome bath and body and personal care products. Smell Good Spa. Use code HELLO25 for 25% off your order. Live good, feel good, smell good wholesomely. SmellGoodSpa.com Hi everyone, Dr. Angela here. Did you know that Daily Spark is now on Facebook? That's right, you can visit with me at facebook.com forward slash Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I want to know more about what you're thinking. I'd love to know which interview did you find the most entertaining or the most informative. I want to talk to you and I want you to be able to talk to me. Simply visit facebook.com forward slash Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Isla. My guest today, as you know, is Derek Paul, and we are talking about ecology. We're talking about our environment and how we should interact with our world around us. So, Professor, you were speaking about specific issues that are going on in the world, but I'd like to focus a little bit on the specific issues that you talk about in your book. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I'd love to. And um, I, I want to tell you some very good news that I found out just today. I had a, a conversation with a, a, a man half my age who's very, very occupied in world issues and in ecology. And he said to me, you know, Derek, the solutions are all there. Somewhere in the world, somebody has a solution to all these ecological problems. He said the trouble is that the economic system gets in the way and they can't implement them. So I said to him, have you read my book? He said, no. I said, I'll send you a copy because that's what all my book's about is how to make it possible for people to implement the solutions that already exist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So are you saying that there is an issue when it comes to the environment and money? Uh, yeah. The thing is that the things we need to do, um, uh, basically the, the money is used nowadays principally uh, to fund um, uh, things that are going to make a profit. So uh, you want to start a corporation, you go and borrow some money, and then you have to make a profit each year to pay the interest on the money and pay the shareholders. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, something else is needed. You need a system to fund things that urgently need to be done, and you need a system to fund the restoration of uh, damage that's been done to the environment, improving the soil, getting the forest uh, soil be- up to scratch when it's mm-hmm. been uh, uh, devalued, uh, removing the pollution from the ocean, from the rivers. And my favorite subject is the, uh, in that regard is the Mississippi-Missouri uh, basin in the United States, which is poisoning the Gulf. Uh, most people don't know there are 18,000 square kilometers of water in the of seawater in the gulf that nothing lives in it's dead because it's been poisoned by the chemicals coming down the mississippi system and the world knows how to fix that but it needs it needs a a system an economic system that that can approach the thing scientifically and then fund it Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, wow. and that, by the way, that's, that's a project with a very long term before it produces a profit, but mm-hmm. it increases, ultimately, it increases the wealth of the whole world. And there are 700 mm-hmm. dead zones in the ocean today, and many of them could be fixed. Some probably not, because it's due to thermal effects, temperature, but uh, many of them could be fixed. Mhm, mhm. And you said that's eighteen thousand kilometers, folks. That square is... kilometers. That's a very big territory. Uh, 
You with guys, no that in it. is that is eleven thousand one hundred and eighty-four miles. That Square is miles. amazing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that <laughs> no, is that is yeah. amazing, and I don't it, think that we realize that the number is is quite that large at all. No, no. Uh, but pre- President Obama knew about it, and mm-hmm. he threw some money at the problem, but it didn't solve the problem. In fact, it actually didn't make any difference, uh, according to what I read, uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the size of the dead zone in the ocean. It made some difference in what people were doing, but it obviously... The, the problem as a whole hadn't been uh, made into a, a giant plan to solve it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so it's, but it can be done. It can be done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then you're saying that if we, we have to be aware of money, we have to be aware of the environment, but the two independently don't necessarily fix themselves. We need to make sure that there is full-time attention to this, that there are people that are dedicated to this full-time that really want to utilize all of the resources available to tackle the problem. Yeah, it, it, yeah, for any problem, you're going to need resources. You're going to need um, uh, protect, perhaps material resources. You're going to need um, surely human resources. And then when the plan is done, how you're going to tackle it, uh, then you can start asking for money uh, to get it done. And that has to be freely available. So new organization or new organizations, plural, um, Uh, will be necessary to do the funding of important projects uh, of the nature that do not bring uh, profit the first year and they maybe don't bring profit the first five years. Gotcha. So to what other features of the ecological economy would someone need to draw attention to? Um, Uh, They're all in 15 chapters of my book, but I'll mention uh, perhaps four or five of them. And um, uh, one factor that interests a lot of people is international cooperation. I don't have a chapter on that, but it's mentioned three times. And only this morning I was listening to how people are cooperating internationally. The problem with governments is they tend to be at each other's throats um, and saying, you know, we don't trust the so-and-sos and uh, and they don't trust us. Um, There there is a great deal of international cooperation today, of course, but there needs to be much more, much less military confrontation and a considerable amount of demilitarizing because uh, the, the militarization and the arms industries are using a lot of our resources that need to go into dealing with the environment and to um, coping with climate change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is just awesome. That is just awesome. Well, we still have um, a few minutes, and I want to be able to kind of open up the floor and allow you to share perhaps um, a last thought with us or something that you would want for anyone who has purchased the book to make sure that they take this particular thing away having read the book. What would that be? Well, I I think one of the, the good signs that uh, might be of special interest. Uh, I wanted to say that one of the problems with the economic economic system is that uh, it's very much uh, based on profit making. And if you if you personally wanted to register a new corporation, you would find that the your duties as head of the corporation uh, would be to make a profit. And that's the only duty you would have. Uh, Now, the United States has been very go-ahead in this respect. And about in the last uh, eight years, uh, at least 25 or 30 states have put through legislation that allows somebody 
to register a benefit corporation. And a benefit corporation is a corporation that in addition to profit making has a, um, an established legal purpose of doing something beneficial to uh, society or to the environment. And this is a new departure, something quite new in history. And it is spreading, I hope, like wildfire, but it has already interested the Australians, the Italians, and it's, it's, um, it's a coming thing. And I think this is one of the, the good news signs that I, that I see uh, that, that is happening. And, uh, and I think people will enjoy reading about benefit corporations. And um, um, I think the new focus is going to be on health. And uh, I think uh, I have a challenge for your listeners. Um, one of the things that has to change a certain amount uh, to cope with um, the future is the advertising industry because the advertising industry has induced people to become consumers and uh, has created um, a considerable amount of overconsumption. Uh, some people have even become uh, addicted to shopping. I think that a change is needed and uh, uh, I don't think anybody has an answer to that question. What will be the change? So I put that as a challenge for your listeners to think about what could change for the better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Always looking for ways to improve ourselves should be one of our goals. Well, we are out of time, but Professor, I would love for you one last time to make sure that everyone is able to get in contact with you, to make sure that they can pick up a copy of your book, and where would you say is the best place for them to visit you? The, the best is, is Amazon or uh, in the United States, Barnes & Noble, and I think there are other big stores that are selling the book. But they can, if, the book doesn't, if the store doesn't have it in stock, they can order it very quickly um, from Archway Publishing. So it's not a problem, but all kinds of my friends and acquaintances and others have bought it from Amazon as well. All righty. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Paul, Dr. Derek Paul. Thank you so much for being on the show with me today. It's, it's been a pleasure. It really has. And listeners, thank you as well for tuning in. We hope that you have enjoyed this particular show. I know that I have enjoyed bringing you something different, something Something that makes you think about not just yourself this time, but your environment as well and how you play an intricate part in all of the beauty that you see around you. Well, as always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, be awesome, but be blessed in the Lord. Bye-bye.